So, welcome everybody. It's really nice to see people here this evening. And for those of you that don't know who I am, I'll just introduce myself first. So, I'm Professor Pauline Walsh, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And I'm really delighted to be here chairing this evening's inaugural lecture uh, by Professor Ian Cummings. So, it's, it's really nice to have the opportunity to share the work that people do with uh, colleagues, students, uh, um, and other people who, who like to come along. And I think it's important part of Keel's approach to thinking about, you know, we've got so many fantastic staff, we need to make sure that a broader range of people get to hear what they have to say, other than just the direct colleagues that you work with. So it's, um, it's great to be back in person doing these um, after you know, a couple of years of not being able to do so. So the way um, it will work this evening is shortly I'll introduce Ian, say a little bit about him, and then he'll do his uh, lecture. We'll then have an opportunity for some questions. So I've nabbed two colleagues to do the roving mic job. Um, and then after that, there will be a, sh a presentation to Ian of a small gift on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, um, who sends his apologies. He's, he's not been able to attend this evening. So that's how it will play out. And uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about Ian now. So I'm sure most people in the room uh, either know of him or have met him before. Um, but um, Ian started his career in the NHS as a healthcare scientist in haematology. After completing his fellowship, he moved into a research role in blood coagulation disorders at the Regional Haemophilia Centre in Manchester, working on the diagnosis of haemophilia carriers and the prenatal diagnosis of haemophilia. In 1989, Ian moved into developing his NHS management career following the clinicians in management route. <clears throat> Ian was appointed into his first trust CEO role in 1995, becoming the youngest CEO in the NHS, a record he still holds to this day. So there you go, there's a, there's a little dangle for anyone, isn't it? Um, over the years, he's undertaken CEO roles in hospital trusts, commissioning organisations, the West Midlands Regional Team, and then for eight years as CEO at the largest education and training organisation in the world, Health Education England. Alongside his role at Keele, Ian was instrumental in establishing NHS Global, a part um, of HEE that focuses on healthcare professionals coming to the UK to learn and UK professionals gaining experience overseas. This involved work in Myanmar, Thailand, India, Mexico, Uganda, and several Caribbean states. In addition to his managerial career, he's maintained a clinical interest in both pre-hospital medicine and sports medicine, an area in which he holds an MSc. Ian was awarded the OBE by Her Majesty the Queen in 2003 for services to the NHS. He holds honorary degrees from five UK universities and was awarded an honorary fellowship of the Royal College of GPs in 2012. In March 2020, what a, a, you know, a, a month and date we will never ever forget, having completed 25 years as a CEO in the NHS, Ian moved to a portfolio career as chair of the West Midlands Ambulance Service as the UK Ambassador for Healthcare to the Overseas Territories and as a Professor of Global Healthcare at Keele University. In his spare time, Ian enjoys skiing, scuba diving, hill walking and being terrorised by his family's two hooligan Labrador puppies. He also works as a volunteer first responder for West Midlands Ambulance Service. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ian to come up and give us his inaugural lecture this evening.
Thank you, Pauline. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along this evening. I was saying I feel a little bit of a fraud in some ways because I've been in post for three years now and it's, it's taken three years to actually get, get here to be able to, to present. But it is so nice, as Pauline said, to be able to be back in person in, in a lecture theatre after many years of delivering uh, presentations and talk via Teams. And I know many people in the room will know that it's just not the same. So, what I'm going to talk about tonight is healthcare in the next 15 years. What's it going to look like? What are the challenges going to be? How are we going to try and restore not just our healthcare system, but indeed healthcare systems around the world to something that is safe and sustainable? Because I don't believe that that's the position that we're actually in at the moment. So if you take a look at this slide, which, which actually appeared many years ago, I'm sure there are people listening to this presentation today that would recognise that our NHS is not in good shape. We have challenges with workforce. We have challenges with backlog, waiting times in particular. We have financial challenges. And we have a number of people that are simply feeling overwhelmed by the size of the task. We have a workforce that is unhappy, generally speaking, at the moment as well. I was with a group of NHS chief executives last week and I asked them to tell me what, the, what their in-tray looked like at the moment, what their biggest challenges were. And they said to me four things. Workforce, money, performance, and quality of care. And those are the four challenges that our NHS is currently facing workforce, money, performance, and quality of care. The amount of time that's being spent on those four areas means that people are unable to give the required amount of attention to innovation, change, sustainability, new service models. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is how we might actually look at some of the global drivers of change in healthcare and consider how we're able to use those to reinvigorate, revitalize our own healthcare system. So in Pauline's kind introduction, she made reference to the fact that I joined the National Health Service in the mid 1980s. Um, I was actually reflecting on this and I don't believe I've ever actually worked for a National Health Service. I believe I've spent most of the last almost 40 years working for a National Sickness Service. And that's one of the first things that we've got to consider how we change. We can't just focus on diagnosis and treatment. We've got to be serious about prediction and prevention if we're to provide a sustainable healthcare service. Our NHS is going to be 50 years old this year, and it's changed dramatically since 1948, but has actually retained the core values at free of the time of need with universal access to the entire population. That universal access is really important because it's removed a threat from so many people about not being able to access treatment because they can't afford it. Some of you have heard me talk before about my grandmother. When my grandmother was giving birth to my father in 1930, they were not well off. My grandfather and grandmother could not afford to pay for a doctor to come out some 18 years before the NHS. My grandmother was giving birth. She was a tiny lady. My dad, when he was born, was 12 pound 8 ounces. And he got stuck. The midwife came downstairs and said to my grandfather, I don't think I can save both your wife and the child. At which stage my grandfather apparently promptly fainted and the GP then spent more, uh, sorry, and the midwife then spent more time looking after my grandfather who'd fainted and knocked his head on the hearth than, than she actually was able to with my grandmother. The doctor came out. The doctor delivered my dad. It was a happy ending. My grandmother was okay. My dad was okay. They were still really worried about how they would pay the doctor's bill. The doctor said, there will be no charge. My dad's middle name is that doctor's surname. 
for the reason that they couldn't believe that that level of generosity would be offered. Now, of course, as we move through the generations, we've become more and more reliant on the NHS. We've become more and more uh, used to expecting the NHS there to be, to be there whenever we need it. The long waiting times of years ago, the concept of not delivering the doctor has very much changed as we've moved more into a consumerist society who wants to be able to access healthcare now, preferably electronically, or if not electronically, certainly at times that we want it as a consumer of healthcare. The healthcare system in this country is not perfect, but it is still the envy of the world, and it is still something that we should be proud of. We spend a phenomenal amount of money on healthcare in this country. The figures for 22-23 are that £185 billion of public money was spent on healthcare, and that is in England alone. £185 billion. That is significantly more than the GDP of many countries around the world that we are just spending on our healthcare system. We're also a major employer in the UK. We're actually in the top four of employers uh, around the world in terms of the number of staff that we directly employ. So as well as providing a critical service to the population, we're also a critical employer that in many parts of our country is actually a really key employer in keeping the economy of that particular area running. We have public confidence although public confidence at the moment is at the lowest it's been for quite a few years. There's a real desire from the public to maintain some form of free at the point of need universal healthcare system. But the NHS has always been and will always be a political football. And therefore it raised questions about whether or not the model we have at the moment is sustainable. I personally believe it is. But you'll know from media coverage recently that there are other voices out there that actually believe it's time to move to an insurance-based model or a, a, some other different form of healthcare delivery system. I was mindful that um, Nigel Lawson passed away recently. And one of Nigel Lawson's favorite quotes is on the bottom of this slide, which is that the NHS is the closest thing that the English people have to a national religion. And actually, I really understand the point he was trying to make here, that we are so wedded to the National Health Service. Around the time of every general election, an opinion poll is done across a very large subset of the population, asking people what are the most important factors that they will base their vote on in the election. In the last 75 years worth of general elections, the National Health Service has never been out of the top three. And for many of those elections, it has been the number one issue. So it's critically important to the population and the population will cast their votes in terms of how they believe that parties will have an impact on the National Health Service. So as we move through the next um, 45 minutes or so, I want to talk about five global drivers of change. These were set out in a document that was called Framework 15, that was produced some six or seven years ago by Health Education England, that was revised uh, then about three years ago, and then revised again and just about to be published. And the five global drivers of change are set out on this slide. So the first biggest challenge we have are demographics. What is happening to our population? What is happening to the profile of disease in our population? The second one is the impact of technology and innovation on the way in which we are able to deliver healthcare in the future. The third, social, political, economic, and environmental changes. The fourth, current and future service models, and in particular, how we implement new service models. And then the final area, one of the most important areas, is all around people. It's around the expectations of our population, the people who we serve, but it's also around the expectations of the workforce. And we have to remember, when we talk about people, it's not just the 
population we serve, it is the workforce as well and what their expectations are for the future. So let's have a look at these in a little bit more detail. So demographics and population challenges that are facing us. So if I summarize, the population of this country is aging, but we are not aging in good health. The population of this country is also growing. So although we've seen increased funding into our National Health Service, a significant amount of that increased funding has disappeared into the growth of the population that we've actually seen. Okay? So as we hear any politicians talking about how much more funding the NHS spends now than X years ago, the first thing we need to do is, is to ask, well, what, what's the population growth been in that period? And if we look ahead 14, 15 years from now, in 2037, it's projected that there will be 55% more people aged over 85 than we have at the moment. Those people who work in healthcare will know that that is the population that take up the vast majority of resource, and that population is going to grow by 55%. How are we going to be able to provide a sustainable healthcare system? And actually, it's not even across the country as a whole. So if we're in Somerset and Dorset and Cornwall, then um, one third of the population in those areas will be over 85 years of age. I'm talking about healthcare tonight, but can I also put a plea in for colleagues and friends working in social care? Because we work in a way that should be far more seamless than it is. We cannot provide our services without linkages through to each other. These challenges are probably going to be even greater for colleagues in social care than they are in healthcare. Um, two thirds of people aged over 65 are expected to have more than one long-term condition. And a third of the population aged over 65 are going to have mental health needs on top of whatever the long-term conditions are um, from the physical health perspective. So this is not just about how do we sort out somebody's diabetes or heart disease or whatever it may be. There's, there's the underlying challenge of growth in mental health conditions as well. So um, average health spending is five times greater for an 85-year-old than it is for a 30-year-old. And those are figures based in, in 2015. But also on top of that, the cost of ill health in terms of human suffering is absolutely incalculable in terms of the damage it does to populations, the damage it does to individuals. What we don't know for sure is that this is going to be a linear trajectory. We have got the opportunity to bend this curve. We have got the opportunity to get serious about prevention. And we need to start that now, not start that in 15 years' time when we're suddenly faced with the problem that's 55% bigger than it is at the moment. If you want to see it as a graphical form, then the uh, outline of that graph shows what the population is going to be in 2035. The shaded area is the population in 2010. Now, just to scare people a little bit more, back in 2020, Public Health England said that a third of all babies born in 2020 would live to be 100 years old. So a third of babies born in 2020 would live to be 100 years old. They also said that the first person to live to be 150 years old has already been born. Could be one of us. I have to say, I hope it's not me, but it could be one of us. Now, if a third of the population are going to live to be 100 years old, assume for a moment that people aren't really earning significant amounts of money for the first 25 years of their life. And assume for a moment that even with the changes we're going to see that people are retiring at 75, then for 50 years of their life, people are not making a significant contribution to the economy. Half of their life? How are we going to be able to afford that from the health and care perspective? And don't even get me started on the 150-year-olds. And bear in mind, if a third of the population are going to live to be 100, then a significant percentage are going to live to be to be one over 100 years old. So we saw a 68 million, uh, sorry, the population by 2022 was 68 million. 
So the growth from 2012 to 2022 was 7%. Is it reasonable to assume that we're going to see a 7, 8, 9, 10% growth in the next 15 years? Probably. That's the potential for this country. We're expecting to see a 30% increase in the number of people with three or more long-term conditions. And this is an interesting one here. There are currently about one and a half million people in the country with somewhere in the region uh, of a population that's between 55 and 60 million. We can debate what it actually is. I'm talking about England here. So there are one and a half million people with long-term conditions, and we spend 70% of our entire budget on that one and a half million people. That's where we need to be focusing some of our efforts in terms of secondary prevention, but also primary prevention to make sure that that number isn't growing. Does public health have a role? Does prevention ever actually do anything? Can we ever bend this curve? Well, I've put this slide on because actually this is one of my favorite graphs of all time. And this is from um, the public health team in the West Midlands. And this shows one intervention and the impact that it's had, not just on people's lives, but also on the expenditure in the healthcare system. So, You'll see here, the red line is the admissions to hospital with an acute myocardial infarction, and it's been seasonally adjusted. And you'll see from May 2002, apologies if the graph's not very clear, right the way through until 2007, that it's pretty consistent. Number of people who are admitted to hospital in England with an acute myocardial infarction. Um, look at the green line. What happened in 2007? Some of you may remember, we introduced the ban on smoking in public places in 2007. Look at what's happened to hospital admissions. This graph, by the way, carries on at a lower level. Look at what's happened to hospital admissions for acute myocardial infarction. Now, <clears throat> leaving aside the impact on the individuals and their life, just for a moment. Um, the tariff for a hospital admission, the cost for a hospital admission for an acute myocardial infarction is about £3,000. And we've seen a reduction of 5,600 hospital admissions a year with acute myocardial infarctions. Do the maths, and there's a saving of £17 million a year to the NHS as a result of introducing a ban on smoking in public places. This gets more interesting. Some of those will be smokers, because we know that an additional 300,000 smokers quitted as a result of taking the opportunity of that ban on smoking in public places. But actually, that doesn't account for all of this by any means. A big chunk of this was passive smoking. It was people who don't normally smoke, who were in pubs, bars, restaurants, clubs, being exposed to other people's smoke who were being admitted with an acute myocardial infarction. So if you ever want an argument that public health intervention uh, works, then that's it. I could give you helmets, I could give you seat belts, I could give you uh, alcohol limits for driving, I could keep going. And that's before we start on uh, a number of other areas that I'm going to touch on a little bit later, such as diet and exercise, etc. So let's think about technology and innovation. Um, a few issues I want to unpack here, and this, this is one of the two main areas that I want to focus on actually tonight. So this, I remember when I first used this slide and I stood in uh, groups such as this and said, oh, this is a new technology. Actually, this isn't new technology at all anymore. This is at least 10 years old now. This is a Cisco Systems Health booth. It was designed, with apologies to any GPs in the audience, to um, part of the marketing was that these, these will replace GPs. No, they won't. Complete rubbish. They will not replace GPs. The idea is that these are an adjunct to GPs that might take some of the workload away from GPs to allow them to spend more time focusing 
on the population that we need them to focus on. So the idea behind this is you go in, you sit down. They do look a bit like a public toilet, which may have been a mistake in terms of planning these, but you go in, you sit down. The seat you're sitting in weighs you. There are sensors that's measuring your temperature, measuring your respiration. You're having your pulse oximetry done by a little probe that's on the, the armrest next to you. Um, your hemoglobin is being measured by shining laser through uh, your finger. All that information is being brought together, processed through a black box, sent down the wire to a triage nurse who you're talking to through a video conferencing screen in front of you. That triage nurse is having a conversation with you. If you need to be put through in real time to a GP, you are like that. If you need to be put through to a specialist direct, uh, doctor, you are like that. If you need medication at the end of your consultation, you don't get a prescription because there's a dispensing robot built into the back of this that actually issues a range of medications that are probably appropriate for the most common people to use this sort of service. I remember talking to a group from the Royal College of General Practitioners about 15 years ago about this, and they very nicely split into two. Never, unsafe, dangerous, not doing it, not going there, it will never happen, one group. Second group, there might be something in this, because actually we have a number of people who are coming to see us whose care is much more transactional, who actually, if they're accessing the right person, then an appropriate diagnosis could be made through remote links. And actually, if this takes work away from my busy practice, then it gives me time to focus on other things. Of course, we have had a pilot of much of this during COVID. And one of the things we need to focus on over the next 15 years is that we don't lose some of the benefits that, or some of the opportunities that COVID actually gave us to practice healthcare differently. Some of them we don't want to keep, but some of them we may well do. And I say that on the back of somebody who was involved in 2009 in allowing a very early form of artificial intelligence to prescribe prescription-only medication here in the West Midlands. So a simple algorithm was developed to determine whether or not somebody, was ha somebody had flu. And you remember 2009, we had a significant uh, flu outbreak that everybody's getting very worried about. You could go online, which not everybody had access to online, but many people did. You could go online, you were asked a series of questions which came to a conclusion about whether it was likely you had flu or not. If it was likely that you had flu, it printed out a voucher which was actually a prescription that which you could take away and get your antivirals. We can debate whether they work or not, but that's a separate argument. You got your, your prescription produced by a computer algorithm. We've not taken that much further in the last 14 years. And everybody was saying at the time, this is the beginning of things to come. This will change uh, how we interact with uh, our healthcare professionals, but it's not moved on hugely. Of course, a very simple example here, that, that's purely a, a, a tympanic thermometer, that one example, it could be blood glucose, could be a range of things where people are able to have a device in their own home or uh, in their own pocket or wherever it may be that is capturing information and forwarding in that information through to their healthcare professional, allowing for much more remote monitoring of an individual's condition. And of course, that then brings us to the hospital at home type concept where we could have a patient in their own bed with medication uh, intake tracking, remote health monitoring, uh, we've got drugs tracking, we've got medical inventory and, uh, and equipment tracking, all being fed through that allows healthcare professionals to keep an eye on somebody in their own home. There is a problem with this, by the way, and the problem with this is the lack of human interaction, particularly if you live on your own. I know when my mum was, was very poorly in hospital, um, the thing that she actually valued the most was the relationship that she developed with one of the people who used to come every day to clean the ward, to clean the bay that she was based in, because she used to have a really nice 10 or 15 minute chat every day while this woman was doing the work. And that social contact was really important to her. So I think as we think about things like this, we do have to just think about the impact. Um, why have I put a picture of a kettle on here? Well, there's some interesting research being done that as we get older, 
and particularly as we get into our 70s and our 80s, we more and more become creatures of habit. And particularly when it comes to things like the time that we wake up in the morning, the time that we get out of bed in the morning, and our routine. And there's a narrow window in which people who perhaps regularly make themselves toast or a cup of tea in the morning will turn the toaster on or the kettle on. So, Internet of Things, let's connect toasters and kettles to the internet. We know that if Mrs. Smith turns her kettle on at 8 o'clock every morning and all of a sudden she hasn't turned a kettle on by 8.30, then she's either not there or she's not very well. We can use that to help start to build an intelligent perspective of what's actually happening and trigger help and support for people. So, what are the opportunities around technology for healthcare? Well, first of all, remote consultation, video conferencing, already being used. And in fact, with group, we've, we've been spending some time talking about that today. Remote surveillance and support, we've talked about. Decision aids, prompts for people who may be receiving information from multiple sources at once. Uh, prompts around, can, have you considered this, right the way to full-blown diagnosis. Machine learning and, and AI, with a couple of the experts in the room, I'm, I'm going to avoid going into too much detail here, but there's everything from automation of routine tasks to free up clinician time, right the way through to diagnosis and treatment actually being undertaken by artificial intelligence. A few years ago, I was talking to a group of um, relatively new surgical trainees and the training program director was on before me and I thought I was being a little bit radical in my talk but she stood up in front of them and said right if any of you think you're going to be diagnosing anything in the next 15 years I think you've got it wrong discuss I actually think she's right AI is probably going to be better at diagnosis than many humans we already know that computers are better at detecting breast cancer on mammograms than humans. About 10% better, by the way. So why are we still using the human eye? Much of this is about how we manage change. Again, we, we were talking earlier on today. Um, I do some work with St. Helena a remote territory stuck in the middle of the South Atlantic. Every three months, they have an optometrist that goes to St. Helena who sees any patients who may uh, want their eyes checking, who would issue the prescriptions for contact lenses or glasses or whatever, would take those back with it to South Africa. They would all be made up and they'd all be posted back to St. Helena. There's now a prototype box available that you sit down, you put your head in. It does your visual field, it measures your pressures, it measures your refraction, it takes a photograph of the back of your eye, it fires the whole lot off down the line. Somebody looks at it, or actually more likely a computer, uh, considers it all, and then your glasses arrive through the post. What does that do to the profession of optometry? What does that do to the hundreds of 18-year-olds that signed up on a course last September at universities across the country to train to be optometrists. I personally don't believe that optometry as a profession is going to exist in the way it does at the moment into the future. What may happen is that optometrists become almost the GP equivalent for eye medicine in the high street. But if we're going to do that, we need to train them differently. When are we going to stop spending as much time training radiologists in sitting in a darkened room gazing at 50 shades of grey? When are we going to recognise that histopathology and looking down a microscope at patterns and colours is something that computers are actually better at than we are and change the training pathway accordingly? We aren't good at this. We have done this before with cardiac surgery, but we did it when we realized there were a whole load of cardiac surgeons about to be produced that wouldn't get jobs. There were no jobs for them. We had to intervene in the cardiac surgery training program and sit down with every trainee, some of whom were very upset, some of whom were very angry, and say, we need to retrain you in a different specialty because statins, interventional cardiology, angioplasty, and stenting, 
meant we simply weren't doing the volume of cardiac surgery that was perhaps being predicted. I would argue that within the next 15 years, several jobs in our healthcare system are going to change beyond all recognition as a result of technology and particularly artificial intelligence. So we need to be looking at how we train people now, not when it's too late. What are the opportunities for AI? Well, true globalization of healthcare, I firmly believe that actually some of the biggest benefits from AI initially are going to come out of those areas that have poor access to healthcare because they are likely to embrace this earlier because all of a sudden they've got something where they've got nothing. If you try and introduce it into Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Leeds, it's a bit harder because you're trying to change something. But if you're introducing it where there is nothing, this is, this is a huge benefit. Uh, it gives significantly increased expertise to developing countries. It addresses the deficits that people have in their workforce. It allows better disease surveillance because we can start to automate that. Um, wearables are a really interesting debate. We, we actually, again, had this conversation earlier on today. I wear a Garmin smartwatch. One of the things that this watch does on a daily basis is tell me how stressed I am. I don't know how accurate it is, but what I do know is I've had COVID three times. And on each occasion, I tested positive for COVID the day before I tested positive for COVID, I had a spike in my stress levels on this watch. So whatever it's measuring, it's measuring something that's changing. It is also, of course, generating work for people. Um, again, GPs in the audience, I don't know how many people come to see you and say that my um, Apple watch is saying this to me or my Garmin watch is saying this to me, but it does happen. Um, and it's generating work, and I think we could probably have a debate about the accuracy of it. But as wearables get better and better, people are becoming more aware of their own health, and they have wearables that are telling them more about their own health. And I think there's an interesting debate about uh, whether or not AI will actually reduce health inequalities. Of course, those people who are digitally literate are probably more likely to use it and have access to it equally, um, all you need is an iPad and a connection to a satellite phone, and you've provided healthcare access to an entire population that may have had nothing. So you, I think you could argue that both ways. But there are some downsides. There is going to be an enormous impact on professionals. Um, none of us like change unless it's our idea. That's the coming theory of change, that if it's our idea, we want to embrace it. We want to do it. It's a really good idea because it's ours. If it's somebody else's idea, well, I'm not really very sure about that. I'm actually quite comfortable doing things I'm doing at the moment. So um, it's massive change. Some roles will become redundant. Some roles we will need to change. So we're always going to have radiologists. Of course we are. But actually, I suspect that the amount of time they spend reporting is going to shrink hugely. The amount of time they spend on interventional radiology is going to grow significantly. We're always going to have histopathologists. The amount of time they spend looking down a microscope is going to shrink hugely. The amount of time they spend in MDTs and doing um, other activities is going to grow hugely. So roles are going to, to change. Um, Expert patients, clinical disempowerment. I think this is a really interesting point. As patients get more and more knowledgeable, some healthcare professionals get more and more uncomfortable. Some don't, but some do. Uh, I remember when I was very first appointed as a chief executive, the very first disciplinary process I was involved in against a consultant was a... Um, only the older ones in the audience will know this reference, a Sir Lancelot Spratt type character who was sat there and basically patient came in and said, thank you for seeing me, doctor. These are my symptoms. This is what I think is wrong with me. So what I want to do today is to talk to you about what we do about it. Um, the doctor was so affronted that he actually threw this patient out of the clinic and told him to never come back again uh, because it was just that sheer... Uh, affront to his own professional practice. Now, that was the best part of 30 years ago, and I think life has, has moved on somewhat since. But we are now in a situation where I absolutely guarantee if anybody in this room and watching online had anything wrong with you that was a diagnosis, um, particularly if it was a rarer condition, you will know more about it than almost any healthcare professional you ever come into contact with. It's yours. 
You're vested in it. You need to know about it. So those power dynamics between a healthcare professional and a patient are actually changing. Some people are comfortable with that. Some people are less comfortable with that. And we have to recognize that. And interestingly, I spoke to a group of um, very new, very green medical students who uh, were actually really quite uncomfortable with the concept because it wasn't really what they were expecting. They were expecting to spend five years at medical school and then their postgraduate training to become the expert. Whereas, of course, they are still an expert, but so is the patient. What's changed is we have access to uh, information. So if I jump back for a moment to uh, this slide, you may wonder why I put a picture of a lady up in the middle of this slide. Well, she was a patient in hospital. She was using her iPad, and she was using her iPad while she was in hospital during COVID to keep in contact with her friends, to keep in contact with her grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. She was using FaceTime. But there was a ward round. And on the ward, she was a cardiology patient. And on the ward round, uh, the consultant came to her and said, um, we need to change your medication. I want to switch you from the tablets you're on at the moment to different tablets because I think they'll, they'll work better for you. So she said, oh, thank you very much, doctor. That's absolutely fine. Um, consultant moved on to the next bed. There was a more junior doctor hanging around at the end of her bed. And she said, oh, can, can you just tell me what the tablets are called? So... Uh, the junior doctor told her what the new tablets were called. She promptly Googled them and asked him a really complicated question about the pharmacology of the medication and why the switch was actually being made because she's a retired professor of pharmacy and she's got access to all the information you would ever need. So those dynamics are changing. So expert patients' clinical disempowerment. Education and training impact. We need to start changing how we educate and train people. Public and professional acceptance of AI. Um, I was on an aeroplane recently and uh, chatting to somebody who sat next to me because uh, the aeroplane was a bit delayed because the pilot wasn't really well and they had to get a spare pilot. And we were just talking about the fact that, well, why do we need two pilots? Actually, AI can fly this thing perfectly well. We know it can. Um, drones that are being used in, by Ukraine elsewhere at the moment. Uh, we only really have two pilots there because those of us sat in the rest of the plane would feel decidedly nervous if there was nobody sat in the front of the plane. Um, some of the robotic surgery that, that's undertaken, they did um, uh, a prostatectomy on a patient who was in the United States when the surgeon was in the United Kingdom via a robot. I suppose that is when you hope that you don't lose Wi-Fi connection in the middle of it, isn't it? But, but um, some of this is around public confidence and public uh, convincing the public that what's being offered is safe. I've talked something about uh, care in people's homes, social and psychological support that's still needed if we're looking after people at home. But I think the next point is really quite interesting, which is the medico-legal aspects of AI. So who has primacy? If the AI says it's green, and the doctor says it's blue. Which one do you go with? If, um, if the AMI, AI makes a mistake, we were talking about um, hallucination of AI and how it can almost make things up through uh, deep learning in some ways. Uh, who, who, whose fault is it? Where does the governance actually lie? Is it the person that wrote the software in the first place? Is it the doctor that's overseeing the care of, of that patient. So who's responsible and accountable? I think this is a, an interesting point. And I think in radiology, this is going to drive change in practice uh, more quickly than anything else. Particularly in the United States, you've got a very litigious society. And if we know that machine reading of mammograms is 10% better than human eye reading of mammograms, it's not gonna be long before people simply say, we have to use the machine for everybody. We then get to that tipping point. Uh, and that's going to change practice very quickly indeed. And of course, there's an interesting question about will AI in healthcare increase demands? Um, doctors in the audience, we know smartwatches have increased demands. Um, so will people having greater access to other form of AI increase demands? 
Just before I leave this section, I just wanted to say something very briefly about genomics. Game changer, biggest single change that we're going to see in healthcare, probably the greatest single factor that's going toward, to move us towards prediction and prevention from diagnosis and treatment ever. And this is happening now. Sequencing of the whole human genome, people being able to have information that actually understands what the likelihood of them developing particular uh, conditions is over their lifetime. But we've got so much water to go under the bridge on this. So the, the government have been talking about whole genome sequencing 100% of the population who want it. Costs are now down at a level where that's probably sustainable. It takes about three hours now to sequence a whole human genome as opposed to several years for the first one. It costs less than 500 pounds. It's kind of 350, 400 at the moment to have a whole genome sequenced. Um, for interest, I had my genome sequenced by 23andMe, uh, not the whole genome, but, but chunks of it. And um, I ticked the box to say, yeah, give me the medical report, and then happily sent it off, and I thought, ooh, actually. So I've got the medical report back, so I know I'm at increased likelihood of developing gout. I'm at increased likelihood of developing skin cancer. There are certain medications that if I take them, uh, they won't work because I don't metabolize them properly. But actually, there's nothing serious in there. What if there had been? And again, from talking to GPs, I know that people are taking their output from their 23andMe or whatever it may be and booking a 10-minute appointment with their GP to say, please discuss. So we are generating more and more work. But actually, I believe in the medium and long term, it'll be really beneficial. There are some big ethical issues as well. Um, I don't know how many people are here. Let's say there are 40 people here. Uh, four of you. Your dad isn't who you think it is. Non-paternity is present in 10% uh, of the population, according to data out of Manchester University, and that's data on the basis of genetic tests that weren't done to query paternity. So four of us here, we don't actually know who our dad is, but he isn't who you think it is. Um, if we sequence the whole population, we can't do what we do at the moment, I don't believe. What we do at the moment is we don't tell people so we answer the question we've been asked, which is, has this been passed on through the generations? We don't say, no, you haven't got it because he's not your dad. You know, we kind of miss that bit out. But it will start to cause real problems because if the state knows something about you, I don't believe we can keep that from you. The second point, which actually is just as worrying, just as serious, is um, if we start whole genome sequencing babies, when do we actually break that bad news? Who do we break that bad news to? Do we wait till they're 18 and then they expect an electronic brown envelope to appear on their 18th birthday? Congratulations on your 18th birthday. By the way, you've got a significant increased chance of developing breast cancer. Do we tell the parents when the baby's born? How do we handle it? So a lot of water to go under the bridge, an awful lot that needs thinking through, but it's unstoppable. It has started now and Government is saying within the next seven years, they will be wanting to offer whole genome sequencing to the entire population. That's not very far in the scheme of our 15 years beyond COVID. Social, political, economic, environmental. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this, apart from just talk about money very briefly because of time. But I will just flag the health service in any country in the world has got to get its act together when it comes to environmental factors. We are a million miles off the pace in terms of um, single-use plastics, uh, but also, for example, chlorofluorocarbons. Apparently, the health service now pumps out more chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere than anyone else because we use them as anaesthetic agents, for example. So there's a huge amount of work needs to be done around energy, around recycling, around moving away from single-use back to um, other... Uh, ways of, of actually functioning. So I will, I will just mention that, but let's just talk about money for a minute. Um, there isn't any. Let's be realistic about this. For the next few years, there is not going to be a huge amount of money. We also have a problem in that you don't need to be able to see the figures here, but this is the expenditure of the Department of Health and Social Care in the United Kingdom. This is the next biggest spending department of the Department of Education, and this is the next biggest spending department of the Department of Defense. 
Ministry of Defence. If you add the Ministry of Defence and the Department of Education together, they still don't spend as much as the National Health Service. And that is a problem for us, because in every comprehensive spending review that a government undertakes, we're battling all the other departments, and they know that 1% more coming to health is actually an awful lot of money that could go in many other directions. And um, when we battle for resource every year, we are battling against many other government departments. And as I said at the start of the talk, we are spending an absolute fortune. We're not a million miles off uh, the rest of the pack. So that's the 28 EU countries, and that's the United Kingdom. Obviously, some places, Luxembourg, spend much more. Switzerland, Norway, Iceland spend an awful lot of money on healthcare. By the way, although I've just put that slide up, that is absolutely meaningless because there, there's no point in talking about that slide without looking at outcomes. What do you actually get for it? Because you can spend an awful lot of money in a very bad way and not actually produce anything in terms of health outcomes. But it is just an indication of spending money. When money's tight, we tend to cut services, get rid of people, slow down introducing new technology, cut our training budgets, all of which are actually the wrong thing to do if we want to keep the population healthy. What we need to be focusing on is new technology, early intervention, prevention, self-care, and reducing errors. We spend a fortune in all healthcare systems around the world on putting errors right that were made in the first place. If we actually didn't make as many errors, we'd have more money to start with. And then, of course, there's a number of things in the middle that we should be doing around improving efficiency, procurement, generic prescribing, and stopping doing things that have limited or no value. Um, but how do we shift the focus from here onto here? Because that's where we're actually going to make a difference when budgets are tight. We need to focus relentlessly on quality. I prefer the National Quality Board definition of quality, which is this one, which is around the clinical effectiveness of what we're actually undertaking. Are we providing healthcare that is safe for the patient? And is the patient having a good experience, which includes waiting times, it includes the people that they're interacting with, the whole uh, remit of how an individual feels about healthcare. The World Health Organization has a slightly more complicated version, but actually they basically aggregate to the same thing. So the challenge for our healthcare system in 15 years beyond COVID is not how do we address the real terms reduction in money that we're going to have over the next 15 years? That may be worst case scenario, but let's say static funding or a small growth. But actually, how do we completely redesign our healthcare systems to be of better quality, more efficient, more accessible, and more patient focused, and do that in the context of the same or less real terms resource? You could argue it's a bit motherhood and apple pie, but I believe it's deliverable. And one of the ways to do that is by looking at the current and future service models that we actually have. Now, on that previous slide, you heard me talk about cuts in education and training budgets. It's happening at the moment in NHS organisations up and down the country. Finance directors and others have got their red pen out. Money is going to be horribly tight next year, and they're looking at how much money they can take out of training. Exactly the wrong thing to do. If money's tight, you need to put more money into training around how we can do things differently, how we can do things better. Uh, I was appointed Chief Exec of West Mid Strategic Health Authority back in 2009, and the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt was just starting to look at 23-hour length of stay hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, it's worked phenomenally well there for the right patients, for the patients who are having it, clinical outcomes are as good arguably better. Patient satisfaction is sky high, and even net of the additional investment in staff work in the community, it's cheaper. Why aren't we doing it everywhere? Why have we still got some fairly big orthopedic departments that aren't doing it? They're still working on three-day length of stay? Because we haven't invested in the education and training of the workforce to allow them to consider how we should do something differently, and we haven't given them the time that they actually need to change systems and practices. And we see that time after time. Years ago, when we uh, started doing endometrial ablations and significantly reduced the number of hysterectomies that we were doing, for a period of about six or seven years, there was a correlation between the age of the gynecologist and whether you were likely to have endometrial ablation or hysterectomy. We cannot allow that to be the case. And the way we stop that being a case 
is by investing in education and training. But we spend, 2017, the latest figures I could find, 1.2 billion in our country on research and development, which is good. We've got that investment going into research and development. And then how much did we actually spend on taking that research and development and embedding it in day-to-day -day practice? 50 million. Does that not seem a bit wrong? Should this not be a bicycle as opposed to a penny farthing? Innovation is invention plus adoption plus diffusion. We are good in this country at invention. We are not good at adoption and we are really poor at diffusion. For new clinical practice, innovative clinical practice, it takes about 15 years in this country to go from the invention phase to the widespread diffusion phase. Um, some people have said that that's to do with the cycle of people going through training and the next generation of people coming through to the workforce. I don't know if that's true or not, but that has been put forward as an argument. So finally, concluding with people. There's a quote from The Lancet in 2010. Health is all about people. Beyond the glittering surface of modern technology, the core space of every healthcare system is occupied by the unique encounter between one set of people who need services and another set of people who have been entrusted to deliver them. I couldn't agree with that more. Healthcare is a people game. It's about the interaction between a person and a person. As we go down the line of artificial intelligence and different ways of doing things and video consultations, we mustn't lose that person-to-person -person contact. There is nothing more important than sitting and holding somebody's hand if they're upset or, di or distressed or worried about the future. And we really mustn't uh, lose that in terms of what we do. Now, um, the top line of that slide may surprise you. Surprise me. The workforce in the English NHS increased by 20.5% between 2010 and 2021. We have by far the largest workforce, clinical workforce, whole time equivalents in the NHS now than we have ever had. Doesn't feel like it. And by the way, we've also not got any more beds than we used to have. So why does it feel so pressured? Why are we hearing so many horror stories from the front line? Because we've got a lot of older people. We've got people who are living longer with ill health. The population size has grown. We're pressuring more people through society, through uh, the beds that we actually have. So we have seen a significant growth in our workforce, but we're still some way short of what we need. Um, Percentage of nurses and midwives working in the acute sector rather than the community is the same in 2021 as it was in 2001. Um, what about all these initiatives to shift care from acute to community? What about putting primary care first? I mean, I could reel off about 10 different initiatives that have happened in that period, all focused on the importance of community and primary care and people, keeping people in their own homes, uh, and we haven't changed the percentage one little bit. If we're serious about something, we have to invest in it. The same is true of prevention. We do have many new roles that we've now embedded. So, for example, in January 2014 in the UK, we had 52 physicians associates. We now have 1,250. So I saw somebody use that and go, hooray, brilliant, we've got 1,250. Mm, yeah. Combined health and care workforce is about 3 million. 1,250 people really aren't going to make much difference in that. If we're serious about something, if we believe that that's a solution, we've got to do it uh, at scale. Shortage of workforce, quote the WHO, quote whoever you like, is the biggest single factor, the biggest single challenge facing healthcare in our generation in the next 15 years, however you want to look at that. We have 132 different roles in the NHS. Paramedics, pharmacists, physicians associates, operating department practitioners, nurses, doctors. I could carry on. 
What's that about? If we had a blank piece of paper, would we really sit down and say, oh, we need 132 different roles to treat people? We're living with history. And at some stage, we've got to bite the bullet. And actually, some of the work that some of the uh, regulators, particularly the HCPC, are doing to say, well, could we move towards a common scope of practice? So whether you're a physio or a, a biomedical scientist or um, a dietitian, whatever it may be, you've got a common scope of practice that basically says you are able to do whatever it is that you've been trained to do that then allows people perhaps to move into a different um, advanced practice, advanced clinical practice type role, that would seem to be eminently sensible. But I do think we need to look at 132 and whether or not the solution to everything is a new role, because that's what we've done. That's why we've got 132. We keep creating new ones, never actually crossing anything off the other end. So, as I conclude, I just want to focus for a few moments on some of the other challenges that are facing us. And the first one is the makeup of the workforce. So I'm just in that group by a few months, unfortunately. Uh, so each different generation wants something different out of work. And if I compare baby boomers, so 1946 to 1964, with the Generation Z group, who are coming through now, they want something very different out of work. They want a different work-life balance. They do not measure success in the same way as perhaps baby boomers su measured success. They don't necessarily want a career that as every year goes by, they're able to get a nicer car or a nicer house. They actually want more independence. They want more autonomy. They want to be able to travel. They want to be innovative. Um, as I say to my kids, they've got a lower boredom threshold. They want to do things very differently. If we don't change soon as an employer, we're going to lose even more of the workforce than we do at the moment. People do not want to work now in the way that people were perfectly happy to work 40 or 50 years ago, and we have to recognise that. I've already said our patients are going to be more informed, active and engaged, uh, that in this year, health app downloads, one form or another, are predicted to hit 150 million downloads of health apps that in one way or another are connected to either, you know, um, running, you know, how many calories am I burning right the way through to uh, monitoring my diabetes or heart rate or whatever it may be, 150 million. Google published statistics periodically on what people are looking for on Google, and one of the main topics of Google search is health in one form or another. So people are using Google whether we like it or not. Um, patients are increasingly becoming members of communities of health. That's groups such as a Facebook group for people with diabetes living in particular parts of the country, whatever it may be. They're sharing information, they're sharing intelligence. Um, we can either just leave that to happen or we can actually embrace that and say that's part of how we want to work. Increasingly, patients want to be involved in their decisions. 91% of patients with an active cancer diagnosis want to be involved in every aspect of their care decision. That has grown enormously over the last 15 years in terms of people's desire to be involved. But we do have to recognize that capacity to be engaged isn't equal. So, 15 years beyond COVID. What's the solutions? How do we provide a sustainable healthcare system? We have to focus relentlessly on prediction and prevention. Somewhere approaching 40% of the population aged over 65 in St. Helena have type two diabetes. They have appalling diets. They get no exercise. Can we really allow that to continue? Because do you know what? That small country cannot support the level of secondary complications that are going to rise from people with type 2 diabetes. How do we do something about exercise? How do we do something about diet? Implementing what works. I've put mandating on there. Um, I'm running slightly over, but I'm all right for two minutes. Um, Sir so Stuart Rose did a review of the National Health Service a number of years ago. And Sir so Stuart used to be the chief exec of Marks and Spencers. And one of the biggest shocks that he had when he came to look at the NHS was that um, we didn't mandate anything. Each hospital was 
able to do its own way. Now, I accept we have NICE now, and NICE does actually start to shape some of the mandation. But Stuart Rose said um, if he was in Marks and Spencer's at five o'clock on a Friday evening, he could send a single email and he could absolutely guarantee that whatever he had asked for at five o'clock on Friday evening would have been implemented in every single Marks and Spencer store in the whole world by nine o'clock on Monday morning. If we try that in the NHS, so let's say we're going to take 15% off shirts, blue shirts. So if we try that in the NHS, why shirts? Why 15%? Why blue? Leeds isn't the same as Birmingham, so we need to do it slightly differently. We have a, we have a culture that doesn't really uh, bring people to accept that we should do everything in a consistent way. And I actually believe that some things we may need to go down that route for. Embracing, embracing AI, new technologies, properly managing change, properly managing the implementation of change, not just expecting it to happen. Um, I've gone back here to 2009. Some of you may remember QUIP if you've been involved in the health service. Quality, innovation, productivity, and prevention. Do you know what? It still really resonates with me. And that mantra, focusing on quality, focusing on innovation, focusing on productivity, by that I don't mean just keep thrashing people to work harder. I mean actually looking at the process and how we can make it smoother and focusing on prevention. But the biggest single challenge that we have is going to be workforce. And with workforce, we need to recruit, which we're pretty good at. We need to retain, which has been shocking over the last 15 years. And as part of retaining, we need to retrain to make sure that we have the workforce we need for the future and not the workforce that we need for now or 20 years ago. And my final quote is from Bill Gates. He was talking about computer chips, but I actually think this applies to healthcare systems. And he said that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And therefore we pulled into inaction as a result of perhaps not seeing the immediate process progress being as quick as we would like. I think he's absolutely spot on, and I think that applies to our healthcare systems. And what we need to make sure is that we don't get left with inaction because things aren't happening perhaps as quickly as we thought we might. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.